good evening or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Natasha Kimani, and I'm the head of partnerships and research at Africa No Filter. And today I'm excited to be joined by William Wheeler, who is going to be um, our guest speaker today um, on our ANF Academy Presents. And we are going to be talking about becoming a screen writer. And without further ado, allow me to introduce you to our guests this evening. William Wheeler is a screenwriter, storyteller, and teacher. He received his BFA from New York University in conjunction with Playwrights Horizons Theater School. He is a member of the Writers Guild of America, the Television Academy, and the Writers branch of the Academy of Motion Pictures and Arts and Sciences. Bill has written screenplays for six produced motion pictures. His filmography includes Queen of Country, which I loved, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, The Hoax, and Paramount's Ghost in the Shell. He's done incredible work and we are excited to have him. William, Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to hearing everything you have to share with us today. Over to you, kind sir. Hi, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit today about um, my professional experiences, obviously, about writing Queen of Katwe and about the filmmakers and actors I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, but what I'm going to do is leave that um, leave that for questions. And, and I just want to spend a little time talking about what came before that because before i made any films um i had to become a screenwriter and so that's what i want to talk about a little bit today um maybe there are people listening to this who um are directors or editors or cinematographers or producers or maybe you're someone that just is thinking about doing those things or is curious about doing those things. And I think that creating a film that that moves people, that makes them feel something, it doesn't just require like writing a screenplay or shooting a film. It, it involves becoming um, a writer, becoming a filmmaker. And that's a process that you go through every day. And the good news is you don't, you don't need an agent to be a writer or a director. You don't need really to have any money. You don't need a formal education at a fancy film school. You do not need the right screenwriting software. That's, people worry so much about screenwriting software. It's really not I don't want anyone to be worried about screenwriting software being the obstacle that's going to prevent them from doing what they, uh, making the movie they want to make. And you don't really need to be in any particular city. Um, you certainly don't need to be in Los Angeles or New York or London or places like that. Um, but here's what you do need. You do need a way to write. Pen and paper is fine. Um, computer would be great. Um, you need a place that you can write where you're relaxed, where you're undisturbed, where you have a door that you can close. Some people like to write in cafes or public spaces. Um, I like that sometimes. I like the noise. Sometimes I like to go sit in. Um, I'll go sit in the lobby of a, of a, of a hotel or go sit in um, a cafe or sit outside. You do need to educate yourself. And there's what's so wonderful about this moment is there's so many ways to do that. There's, you know, there's great books, but there's, there's YouTube videos. There's, there's um, all kinds of online options. And, but I think that the thing that you want to do most of all is to watch movies and TV shows. And when you watch them, watch them with your notebook out. And if you really love a movie or a television show, watch it more than once. And 
note to yourself, like, how do they do that? Like, I, like, I love that surprise when the guy goes behind the door, like what, how do they shoot that? And just watch it like a few different times and see how they did it. Notice what the filmmakers are doing. Um, but the number one thing that you need to become a writer or to become a director is you need time. Time is the most, um, it's the hardest investment, but it's also the most important investment that you can make. Because the time you spend developing your craft is really what's going to distinguish you from your competitors. It's what's going to help you um, become the kind of expert that, that can have the facility to, do, to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. And I have noticed that the people at the highest levels of filmmaking and at television, they do, they spend a lot of time doing it because they just love it. For them, it's like playing a game. They just absolutely love having the camera out or writing stories. And so if you're relaxed and you, it feels like play when you're shooting your video or you're writing a story, that's a good thing. It shouldn't feel always so like uh, intense and, and uh, um, uh, pressed. And so if possible, if you write, you ideally should be touching your work pretty much every day. Uh, now that doesn't mean the writing would be good. It doesn't even mean you physically write anything. Like it's more a matter of, can you devote a certain amount of time? Maybe for some people, it would be an hour. Um, for someone else, maybe it's a couple hours. Um, maybe it's three or four times a week. But if, but you have to give that time so that you can give your unconscious time to relax and time to, 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 um, to give you, to, to give you results. And so if you shoot, if you're a filmmaker, you want to shoot images every day. Um, it's not always easy. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I, how I started out. Um, you know, I grew up and my brother and I played a lot of imaginary games. We played cops and astronauts and robbers and pirates. Uh, there's a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you guys may have heard of, I was a dungeon master. And when you are telling stories to a group of 14 year olds and you have to hold their attention, you start to learn about suspense and you start to learn about how to, how to, how to tell a story. And so I moved to New York. I got some training in acting and directing. Um, and I read some plays. I acted in some plays and I, I started trying to write. And then I went, um, to Los Angeles. And I have a little brother. And my brother, when he was 23, and this was a while ago, um, he wrote a script. And almost immediately, it was one of those strange things that would sometimes happen in Hollywood. He wrote this script, it was like the first script he's ever written, and he sold it for a lot of money. <laughs> in Los Angeles. And he was like 21, I was 24. I was his older brother. And all of a sudden he was, he had sold the script for a lot of money. He was um, uh, making new deals to write scripts. And we were a couple of um, kids that did not have a lot of money. We grew up in Pennsylvania. And so this was shocking for all of us we could we just couldn't believe this had happened and it so it, it I got I was like wow okay so this must be the thing that we do my little brother wrote a script and made some money how hard can this be I'm gonna I'm gonna do this too and so uh I started to write scripts because I was ready to 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 get rich and I was ready to uh fly around the world like my little brother was flying around the world and so I wrote a comedy I figured people like comedy so let me write a comedy and so I spent uh I spent six months and I I wrote uh I wrote a comedy 
and I gave it to people and the people said, yeah, the writing, writing is good, but it doesn't, I don't feel you inside it. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's unusual about this. And I said, oh, hmm, well, that must be, this isn't the right concept. So I came up with another concept and I wrote another script and I figured, okay, this will be the one. This is an action movie. People love action movies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a great action movie. And I got the same response where people said, yeah, gosh, this writing, it's really, really quite good writing, but um, it's sort of like everything else. Like it's sort of, if I turn on you know, TV and I watch an old movie, uh, it sort of looks like that. And so a few years later, I was struggling. Um, I had a little girl and my work was selling things on the telephone. So I would sell newspapers on the telephone, um, newspapers that would, uh, you know, the, the financial newspapers that, that people would read to help them figure out what stocks to buy. And um, my brother, who I was very close with and very much wanted, you know, was hope, hopeful that I would succeed also, but, did, what, you know, what could he do? Um, he lived in New York and I lived in Los Angeles. He had moved to New York and we had a very different life. And it made me feel bad about myself. It made me feel like there was something I was doing wrong. And I didn't understand what I was doing wrong. Um, and because it had been a certain amount of time, I, uh, I started to say, yeah, I don't think this is for me. I, I don't think that I'm destined to do writing or to do directing or to make movies. Um, because I had tried and it hadn't worked out the first couple of times. And so I told my, my, my wife at the time, I said, I think I'm going to try to maybe become a stockbroker or get into real estate. I'm going to do something different because this is really hard and it doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be going right for me. And I was, I was very, very deeply disappointed. And I was ashamed of myself. I felt like I had failed doing this thing that obviously was possible for someone in my family to do. And as I was going through this, I was noticing these people I was working with, these telephone salesmen, crazy people, just lunatics who had gone bankrupt and some of them had been criminals and some of them had, you know, um, been involved in 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 all kinds of bizarre criminal criminals enterprises and i started to think that i would be really interested in seeing a movie about people like this and so i started to just take notes about the people that i worked with every day i wrote down my experiences um about with these telephone salesmen like what their their stories and how they talked and their crazy backgrounds and I, um, I put all my feelings about this moment, this difficult moment that I was having into this script this, that I wrote. And I sent it to a place called the Sundance Feature Film Lab. And I was very fortunate. And the script was accepted into the lab. And so I went to Utah and I met mentors and I met helpers and I met people that create community and they helped me get this script to agents and producers and financiers and people that could, that could help. And I've always found it um, surprising that when I was at my most vulnerable and felt like, I did not know how to, you know, figure this out as a writer. That was when the idea that came to me, that was when that flowed for me. It was when I got into the Sundance Lab and I started my life as a professional writer. And um, I, I, I tell that because I think that we have sometimes a lot of, um, limiting beliefs about ourselves and we think that you know first of all we think that if we write one thing or if we shoot one thing 
that that's it. Here we go. Yay. I'm, I'm going to win now. And it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily work that way. You want to, you, it's like anything, you know, if you are learning how to play tennis or play basketball or whatever, you, you, you run a lot of layups, you know, you do a lot of exercises and it is similar for writing. The first thing you need as a writer is a writing process. And this is something you can have now. You don't need to wait to have a writing process. You can have this starting tomorrow if you want to. And um, sometimes what I suggest to people is comparing your, your process as an artist uh, or writer to the cycle of growth in nature. So you start with a seed. You get, you know, you, you're going somewhere on your bike one day or you're, you're and you, that, that idea comes to you. It comes to you in the shower or whatever, whatever some, somewhere surprising. And, you know, it can be anything. Um, Quentin Tarantino once told me that, that his movies start with a song. He gets a song in his head. And he starts seeing something happening in his head. He'll see a boxing match or he'll see a murder. And that's the start of it for him. So maybe it's a story your friend told you about a kidnapping that took place in their hometown. Maybe it's um, a certain recipe you learned from your mother for um, some kind of a dish that you, that you cook and the feelings and the memories that that brings up for you. Um, maybe you just want to tell a story about pirates on a spaceship or something. The seed is there, it comes, usually it just comes with no warning. And for, for, for most of us, it floats around in your head and you're happy because like you have this cool idea in your head and nothing's nothing's bothering it you know it's like oh I have this cool idea and if I ever had the time to write a script it would be so wonderful I'm sure it would be so great but the problem is to become a writer you need to actually it needs to show itself the seed has to turn into a sprout and that means you've got to put something into reality you have to shoot something you have to write something down it can be anything. It can be a few unstructured pages. It can be notes on disconnected ideas you have. Nothing has to be in order. You don't have to know who your characters are. You don't have to know yet what they want. If you do, great, write that down. But you write these disconnected things down and it's like a jumble, right? We've got like our, we've just got like sort of a jumble of ideas maybe um, scribbled down. And you're still kind of happy because you're like, look, I wrote some words down. I made some progress. This is great. Uh, I'm doing okay. But now you're sort of getting a little bit more nervous because the big job is coming, right? The big, the big job that you know you have to do and none of us want to do it. And I'll tell you something, the, the, the top level professionals in the world don't want to sit down and open their document and write a script. That's usually something we all avoid doing. It's, uh, it's hard. And obviously people have different processes. And if for you, if you're one of those people that you can't wait to wake up in the morning, then fantastic, that's your process. But the next step is to let that seed, that sprout grow into a sapling. And that is when you start to bring structure to the process. That's when you start to Think about other movies you've seen before. That's when you bring to bear things you've learned from books you've read. Or uh, you, that's when you start to try to force yourself to think in linear terms about who is this person? What's this person doing? Why are they doing it? What's standing in their way? And you try to create um, a little outline, a little plan for your story. And for some people, the plan can just be a paragraph or two. For other people, they'll write 20 pages and plan every single thing they're going to put in their script. But this process, you keep doing it, it grows. And maybe you get um, the tree. You get a full script. Maybe after struggling and suffering, you finally are able to get the whole script out. And 
that um, is a whole process, and I'd be I'd love to answer tons of questions about any process, you know, any questions you have about writing the process of a script. But in just in the scope of what of what I'm talking about right now, let's imagine that you get there, you've got the full script, right? That's like that's the fruit. That's 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 the thing that you've gotten that you've created. And then you have this moment where you got to bring that this fruit to the market and you got to see if anybody wants to buy it. And that's hard. It's really hard because that's another moment of release where this thing that you love and you spent so much effort on and so much time and it's like you treasure it so deeply. You have to go to this cold, awful place, the market, where the market will be like, yeah, I don't like those kind of apples. Sorry. Bye. Or they'll say, well, yeah, it could work, but just turn the main character from a woman into a man. Or, and you'll get these things where you're like, are you crazy? What, like, no, of course I would never do that. Um, but that's the market. That's the way the market is. The market is a, is a, is a, um, is a bumpy place. And it's not, it's not friendly. It doesn't make you feel good. But if you can fight your way into finding that one vendor that's going to buy your fruit and sell it for you, what the outcome is I want you to be thinking of even now is that will go out into the world and your work is going to create its own seeds. And those seeds are going to inspire other people. And when this process works the way it's supposed to, someone else is going to see your movie or, and they're going to think, wow, like, I love that thing where, you know, at the end where they did this, and that, like, that gives me an idea for a story. And, and that really is something I find inspiring. The fact that the work that we do it goes out into the world and it is it is inspiring other people and it's this endless regenerative cycle of uh of art um and we have many things that are going to be obstacles we have many things that are going to slow us down um i have some very specific ideas about um how we can overcome some of those obstacles in our process and um but I would say that in general, um, because I also I want to I want to hear any questions that that folks have. Um, trust yourselves because you're you're ready. You're ready to do this. The control the things that you can control. You can control having enough time to write. You can control having a way to write. You can control. Um, learning, uh, educating yourself, because it doesn't have to be at a fancy film school. It, it, it really doesn't. There's, I mean, the people that went to film, you know, went to really good film schools often say that it was like a small part of, of, of what was important about their, about their process. Um, and so with, you know, the idea that You want to you want to get busy as soon as possible so that you can bring these dreams to life. And so I want to just finish with one idea before we open it to questions. And I want to propose a thought experiment to all of you. What if someone came to you today and said, I would like to give you a million dollars for your script? That you that 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 seed in your head, I know it's great. I'm going to give you a million dollars in advance, or I'm going to give you a million dollars to make this movie. Go, you're you're done. You win. Here's the money. And the question is, what would you do then? And what I would suggest is that probably, you know. If 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 I gave you a million dollars for a script, you would say, oh, my God, I've got quite a responsibility to create something really, really um, professional 
really flawless. Like, my God, I'm getting paid a lot of money to do this. I want something that makes the person that gave me this money say, what, yeah, this was worth what I paid for it. And so if you were in another business, if you were an entrepreneur and you were opening a restaurant, you'd spend thousands of dollars on kitchen equipment and chairs and tables, right? You'd lease out a space, you get access to the best ingredients. Um, and yet, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, online course on directing for $22. I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. You know, if you were in real estate and you're trying to sell a house, you know, you would have to look up listings, you have to call people for appointments. And so if you imagine somebody in advance is paying a million dollars for your script, you would take the time to make sure every character in that screenplay sounds like a real person. You would, if you were writing about a police person, you know, a, a, a cop, you would take the time to go talk to a cop. You would hang out in a police station. You would do ride-alongs where you find out how their lives worked and what they thought about and what they talked about. You'd write down the little things that they say. You'd take pictures of details like their coffee cup and their whiteboard and little locker where they put their gun. You would take the time to make sure every scene that you wrote was ending on a note of curiosity and change and, and sort of asking for the next piece of information. If you were paid a million dollars, you would probably take the time to write backstories for all of your characters that were 15 or 20 pages long and think about everything from how they walk to how they talk to where they live to who their siblings are, what they're afraid of, what they want. You would make sure if you were writing paramedics that you weren't making it up. You would research what, what are the terms that paramedics use when they talk to each other. Uh, you, 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 like you, would, you would listen to actual paramedics talk. If your story was set in a place that you weren't in, you'd figure out a way to go there and to, and to check that place out. Or at the very least, you'd very deeply research it and find out what it looks like. And it feels luxurious to do that kind of thing now in advance before someone has given you a million dollars. But that is what the process asks of us at the highest levels. And if you can grant yourself that now, if you can grant yourself the luxury and believe in yourself enough to invest that kind of time and commitment now, you are distinguishing yourself in an unusual way from the people around you. And it's the best, um, it's the best bet I can give you on how you can get the movie that's in your head or in your heart um, out into the world, which I hope all of you do. So why don't we have, um, I want to have some questions from folks. Thank you so much, William. That was fantastic. I think some of my take homes that I loved is that, you know, just start with whatever you have, a pen and paper, laptop and a place that you could write. And time is the hardest and most important investment. And before we open it up, I, I, I have a few questions of my own that I'd like to ask if that's okay. Of course, I and, love it. Um, and I think the first one is, you know, what do I start with or what if someone wants to begin, where do they begin? Do they begin with structure or do they begin with scenes? Is there a particular way that they should begin writing? Um, it's a good question. I, I think that I think that for people, sometimes there are different answers to those questions. I think sometimes there's a personal way. And what I would say is row, row in the river the direction with the current. So if you like writing scenes. If it comes to you in scenes, write a whole bunch of scenes. Start with that. If you are a person that is a real planner and gets a lot of pleasure out of like, okay, first I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this. Great. Start with an outline. Um, you can, you know, take the wheel wherever, wherever it feels like you can grab it. Um, and then what I would say is, it, as you begin to put the pieces together, the most important thing is to try to allow your characters some autonomy. 
don't just push them around and like tell them to do things. Get to know them and listen to them and ask the question, what, what would, you know, that's all, maybe someone else would run away in this situation, but maybe this person that I now know, Johnny or, you know, or, or, or Elsie or whoever, maybe they would do something different because yeah. they are a different kind of person. And this is part of how they're unusual. And this is part of who they are. So I would say allowing your characters to surprise you mm. and to bother you. Okay. Because what happens is we, we, we think about plot. We think about, oh my gosh, it would be so cool if just as they're getting to the place where they've made the robbery, they find out they've forgotten their guns and they've left them at home. Um, but if you have set up a character who is meticulous and a character who it was always somebody who double checks every list and checks it twice, then that's not going to work. That's not the plot for your story because that person wouldn't forget those guns, mm -hmm. right? And so you, 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 even when you get something cool in your head that you want to do, if it's not your character that's going to do it, it's not going to feel satisfying to the to the audience. And so that would be my, my I guess my best guess is sort of how, how to get started and a couple of things to keep in mind. Thank you, William. Uh, just um, some housekeeping. If you have any questions, I request that you direct them to the Q&A because the chat is just for people to introduce themselves and make comments. Please direct your questions to the Q&A chat box. Um, I'm going to ask a few from the Q&A chat box before I continue with my questions. Um, this is from Asamta Audu. Um, how did you come to write for Queen of Katwe? I have an MSc in screenwriting and directing, and I've been told by producers that they love the way I write. But when it comes to hiring, I'm often left out. I'm finding it difficult to get writing and directing opportunities. I have my website, my details are also available, ETC. How can I practically attack this and ensure um, and she's also won some festivals, um, some of which, some short films, some of which have won international film festivals, you know. So her question is, Asamta asks, how can she navigate this? What are the practical ways that she can get work and opportunities? Um, I, that's a, you know, that's a really fair question. And I, I wish there were one kind of an answer, but I'll do my best to try to um, think about this. Um, now, I think that what's, what's very promising about the time that we're in is I feel as though 20 years ago for Assumpta, it would have been even much harder for her to, you know, for you, Assumpta, to, to, to get those kinds of opportunities. So I do think that the world is opening up, but it's still um, it's still very challenging. It's very difficult. You know, there's not uh, uh, there's not a lot of jobs. There's a lot of people fight, fighting over them. The way I came to write Queen of Katwe was that um, I was lucky enough to have um, a couple of movies made, and there uh, was a director, uh, Mira Nair. Uh, who the director of Queen of Katwe, who actually uh, lives part of the year in Kampala. And she became aware of Fiona's story through a book by Tim, a wonderful book by Tim Crothers. Uh, Fiona Mutesi, was, is, who is the protagonist of the movie Queen of Katwe, the, the, um, uh, the girl that learned uh, how to play chess so wonderfully. And so Mira knew me because we had worked together on another movie called The Reluctant Fundamentalist. And, um, and she sent me the book and asked me what, you know, I thought of it. And I, to be honest, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure I was the right person to, to, to tell the story of Queen of Katwe. And I think that, um, and I, I said to her, are you sure? Like, you know, I'm, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm a white guy. I live in America. I don't, I, you know, I don't know that I'm the perfect person to write this story. Um, for whatever reason, Mira felt that a certain quality that I had 
created in another script that I had a couple of other scripts that she had read of mine that she had done she thought you know was appropriate for me to adapt this story and so I had to kind of take her word for it and um and so the first thing I did was I went uh I went to Kampala and I met Fiona and I met Robert Katende who was her coach and I spent time in Katwe with them and I learned about Robert's program and I met all of the pioneers who were the 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 chess all the chess players that you meet in the movie and what I tried to do because I didn't I did not grow up in Kampala and I I don't I didn't know much about Katwe was I just tried to spend a lot of time with the people that who did and learn from them and learn about their lives and the things that they cared about and what their everyday experience was like. And, um, and so Mira and I worked together very closely on, on, on trying to make sure that the, the, the story we told for the screen was as accurate as possible, was as true as it could, could, could be close to the, what actually happened. And that it was not Disney-fied, that it was not, um, for example, you know, inventing some, you know, person from the United States who comes to Uganda, who finds out about you and know, making that person the star of the story. We call that a white savior narrative. We didn't want to have a white savior narrative. Um, and so, uh, so I'm very proud of the fact that that, that film um, was made by Disney, but it was made 100% in Uganda, and it had a cast that was, I believe, at least 70 or 80% Ugandan, Ugandan cast. Um, and that it is a story told um, where the heroes of the story are the people that actually lived it. Um, and in terms of how can, how can you find ways to, I would say that there's a couple of things you can try to do. You can try to get, if you are someone who likes to tell true stories or nonfiction stories, do your best to seek out the people that the thing happened to, you know, call them up or call up a person who wrote an article that you saw in the newspaper or online about, um, about the event that you're curious about. And just reach out because not everybody, you might see a story that, that no one else quite notices yet. And if you can make, you know, get a relationship with the, the person who wrote that article or the person that had the unusual experience, you can have, you know, say, I'm the one to write this story and create it with that person's input and help. And then maybe you are the one that's bringing the story to the market as opposed to, because the thing is being hired for work is going to be dependent on having a piece of work that that person uh, of yours, that that person sees that they feel strongly enough about that they're going to hire you over someone with less, you know, with more, that might have more experience than you do. Um, but I would say, Keep trying to get work, but even more importantly, keep trying to create good work because ultimately that's what's going to, that's what's going to. I like you know, that. Problem for you. <laughs> I like that. Um, this is a question from Jordan Goldberg, who incidentally um, was a PA on the last two weeks of Queen of Katwe. He's from oh, South Africa. Um, so he's excited to be on this work. Hey, Jordan. Uh, his question is regarding character development specifically when characters have to make really hard choices. So essentially the why, why would your character make these particular choices? When writing a character, do you ever delve into their backstory that might not necessarily make it to the final draft, but just for you to give yourself a better understanding on your character's mindset? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question because it speaks to two things that I think are really important about about successful stories. Mm. One is that we're most um, compelled by characters who make extremely hard choices. And so when you can 
put your character into a situation where they're being forced to make a very difficult choice of some kind. What we are tempted to do is to make it a little easier for them, is to, is to say like, you know, uh, well, as, as writer, you know, it's almost like we feel bad for our characters. We don't want them to suffer too much. And we need to develop a certain ruthlessness where the more trouble our characters get into, the better off our story is. And the best kind of trouble is when they have to make a decision that is irreversible, when they have to burn a bridge, when they have to do something from which there is no returning. Um, because what happens is that all of us, when we see that moment, are pulled into like, oh my God, like, wow, that's a big deal. I'm, this is a big deal. They just, you know, abandoned the job that they've had for 11 years and they quit, you know, quit loudly in front of the boss and everyone and now, like, what am I going to do? We all really respond to those kinds of, of moments and characters. And in terms of backstory, um, we must know, you must know, the audience doesn't necessarily have to know, but you must know who this person is, what their formative life looked like. You don't have to know, and you don't have to know everything, but you, you need to know the relevant pieces so that the choices that your character makes has special relevance for them. Because different things trigger us in different ways, you know, but if I, I mean, you know, the whatever, a bad example would be um, for someone who is um, who's a daredevil and, and who enjoys taking risks, walking a, you know, a tightrope between two buildings or across a mountain is cool. It's something like that might be fun, but for someone that has been afraid of heights their whole life, to go try to do something like that. That has a, a different intensity and a different meaning because of the, the fear they're overcoming and because of what may have happened to them when they were younger to make them have that fear of heights. So of course, yeah, we wanna always think about the psychology of our characters, the why, who are they? What are they, what are they afraid of? What do they want? What happened to them? What unresolved problem are they still trying to solve? Um, all those are extremely relevant questions that we that we want to think about as we're we're creating our characters and our stories. I love that. Um, um, and we have several questions around writer's block. In fact, six people have asked. You know, that's my favorite subject. <laughs> how do I get past this block, you know, to ensure yeah. that I can- I'm going to move because so the light isn't <laughs> sort of dodging. Okay, so, yeah, things. you know, you know, they've run out of juice. You know, what do they do? What do they need to do to keep writing? Yeah. Um, I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a few things that I recommend. And this is something that I actually, I think about and I've written about. And um, uh, I'll give you just a sort of a, a, a couple ways of thinking about this. You know, okay. So let's, let, let's all put ourselves into that situation. Okay. We made a plan. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up early. I'm going to get up at six o'clock in the morning and turn on my computer and I'm going to write for three hours before I go to work. Right. Okay. Great. I can't wait. This is going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to write so well. This is going to be so terrific. Okay. Tomorrow morning, the alarm rings and you have a little bit of that sort of sick feeling like you just don't want to do it. Like, it, I just think I'd rather, why don't I just like look at Twitter for a little while? Okay, I'm going to be on Twitter for a little while. Okay, that's fine. Eh, it's only 9.20. I'll still, I'll still make it happen. That's good. But then we got to have a cup of coffee. Like who can, who can write without a cup of coffee? Nobody can write without a cup of coffee. Okay, now we're going to have a cup of coffee. All right, I've enjoyed my coffee. I'm, 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 okay. mm, it's 9.45. Oh boy. Oh, okay. 
well, uh, I need to take a shower. I mean, my God, I don't want to write being unclean. So I'm just going to take a quick shower. Then I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i have my coffee. I'm going to go. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to get to work. And then now I'm sitting down. But now, now it's 10.15. I can't start writing if I've only got an hour and 40 minutes. Probably it would be better to do it tomorrow. I'll get a fresh start. I'll get a very, okay. We've all been through that. We, all of us do that around this kind of work. I, I, I know it's like a comedy. It's just ridiculous. Everyone. And I don't care how long you've been doing it. I don't care if you're, if, if you're a professional, if you're an amateur, if you, no matter who you are, we've all been through this. And, and so I have a couple of theories about why this happens. And I have a couple of strategies that I try to use when this happens for myself. Um, I think that it happens because we're afraid to write and we're afraid to write because if we write and we write our very, very best and it isn't as good as we hope it is, that means we're not talented. And if we're not talented, we're never going to be able to, you know, write a script that's good enough to bring our dreams to life, which is perhaps of working, being a professional, or if you're already professional of having a success that you haven't had before. So really it's our, it's our ego. It's the part of us that wants validation. It's the part of us that wants to be celebrated and seen that is always saying to us, yeah, better we are. maybe we don't do, let's not do that writing thing. And, but there are, our ego confuses us because you don't want me to write, but you want me to be famous and wonderful and 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 for everybody to love this movie and to be able to share this story with the world. That's not reasonable. <laughs> so how do we overcome our egos, um, this fear that wants us to stay like static? Mm -hmm. And the main, there's a few ways to do it. For me, one of the things I do is I simply will say out loud, like, I'm afraid to write right now. I'll just say it, like put a name on it at least. You know, I don't, I, I'm afraid. Mm. And sometimes I'll just say to myself, yeah, I'm because if, if this isn't good, if this movie goes down, then this thing isn't going to happen that I want to have happen. And, you know, so that's what I'm really afraid of. I'm afraid it's not going to be the way I want it to be. Mm. But the truth is, that's not part of the promise. The promise of writing is the promise of um, communicating your experience of something in the world to someone else. And other things that may happen, like getting paid to write or getting a career as a writer, or those are wonderful and those are those are great goals worth going for. But if you can calm those goals down, and just calm them down, tell them to just take a breath, just take, okay, you just be over there for a minute. Mm -hmm. I understand you want to be famous and wonderful. You want everybody to celebrate you and all that's great. You just stay there for a little while. We have, I got something else I need to do. Because the problem is those are distractions that just prevent you from relaxing. And you need to be relaxed to write. So whatever you can do, what I recommend that people do is treat themselves like, like understand you're going somewhere that's cold, like emotionally cold. Like it's when you're sitting down, you feel like, oh, this is like, this is so hard. So what are the things that make it easier? One of the things that makes it easier is if you've done some research, if you've done some research. I mean, and I, I will do research about anything. I, I will, if I'm writing a scene between two people sitting in an office, I will look up a picture of an office on the internet and I'll figure, okay, what kind of chairs are they sitting in? Where are they? Just so I can give myself something to help me. Um, there are, so give yourself like a picture of the place that you're writing in. Um, sometimes I will title my document MUD or garbage, or temporary. And so that we have the sense like, you want to get in the habit of working enough 
so that you don't constantly feel like this is this is it because mm -hmm. it never is like if you're doing this job properly you're going to rewrite these scenes many many times and so really when i'm when i write now as far as i'm concerned i'm just i'm just throwing something up i'm just like i'm just i'm just like all right let's whatever let's okay blah, 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 blah. And that's when the writing starts. Like, I, you know, you give yourself a scaffolding, something to work with, write a bad, bad version of the scene. Um, uh, a friend of mine, John August, who is a very brilliant writer, um, has this thing he calls writing sprints, mm. where you set, set a timer for an hour. And the only rule is you can't stop. <laughs> so you just... You just got to go. <laughs> you just got to go. And um, it doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter if it makes no sense. Now, the reason we need to go through these kinds of mental games with ourselves is because if we, if we believe that the thing that we put on the page today is going to be the thing that people in the world are going to see and judge us on, it's very inhibiting. It's like, it's, it, 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 it's the opposite of feeling relaxed. It's feeling like we're taking a test in front of a thousand people. And it's like, Whoa. what you want to do is say to yourself, no, it's not going to, this isn't the real, this isn't the real one. This is the, this is sort of the pretend version. This is the, this is the, this is a just starting out version. This is the one that, no, you know, nobody's going to see this one. Now, the problem is you're only going to believe yourself if you have a process as a writer. So if you are writing once every three weeks, you're not gonna be able to talk yourself into the idea that you're gonna do multiple versions of this because you have no proof that you're gonna get yourself back into the seat, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so the first and most important thing is devote some time, devote whatever time you can give. If it's 20 minutes a day, great. That's fine. If it's 20 minutes a day, three times a week, okay, maybe, but probably you want to make it be something like ideally, maybe like an hour, five days a week to start. And if you don't want to give it an hour, five days a week, maybe you don't like doing it enough, or, or you know, like maybe it's not important enough, and that's okay too. You have to give yourself permission for that to be true. For some people, that is true. But if you really are burning to do it, start by giving yourself an allotment of time, mm. just a little bit of time. Um, if you have um, all the, the writing I did starting out was while I had um, other work I had to do to pay the bills. So um, I certainly, you know, that's a very real obstacle. I would try to do my best to write before work. Mm. Give your best part of your mind to the writing and then your second best part of the mind to whatever the job is that you're going to do. So those are a couple of strategies. Um, and I'm actually, I'm writing a book about some of this stuff and that I will, um, that I actually would be happy to give, uh, to give to the folks that are here in this workshop. So at the end of this, I can, um, I will, I'll give you my, my, my social stuff. And, and if anyone that wants this book that I'm finishing, I will send you a digital copy happily. Oh, well, that's fantastic. I, I would love a digital copy as well. And I'm trying to capture all the questions. There are quite a number and I'm trying to, you know, give it a mix. Um, you know, I'll try to give shorter answers. No, no, no. I love your answers. I think everyone is just so interested and keen, which is amazing. Nonjabulo Kandawira asks, any tips for fostering a writing community? I find even when I share my work with friends and family, the feedback is nice and not really constructive. How can I ensure that I get people who will give, how can she ensure, he, she ensure that they'll get people that give her constructive feedback? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's mm -hmm. very important. Um, a, a writing, a, a community of artists is, um, is another really important thing that you want to try to cultivate for yourself. And what I would say is that go to friends and family for 
general encouragement, like, like give your mom to read it. Cause you know, your mom's going to, you know, if, if you think your mom's going to say like, you go get them, like, that's great. Good job. Now, if your mom is the type that might say, Hey, I don't like this stuff on I don't know. Then you, 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 I would say that the general responses and encouragement is what you're hoping for from friends and family. From your fellow artists, what you want are um, the nuts and bolts of what, how can I fix this? Like what, like what is not working and how do I fix it? Most of the time, your fellow artists will be able to tell you um, this isn't like this part of the script I didn't understand or this part of the script felt boring and slow or um, this part of the story, why would they do that? If they did that over here, there's a logic gap. Something doesn't make sense. Um, so I guess there's two parts to the question. One is how to incorporate that feedback. Um, mm -hmm. But the, I, the first part of the question was really how do I cultivate that community? And I would say any way possible, you're here, you know, this is a community. There's 200 people, here, you know? So um, anywhere where writers gather, um, some people start on Reddit, some people um, will create online communities. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of online communities of writers and artists. I would, um, there's a wonderful um, uh, uh, community that, that, that some friends of mine created at Sundance called Sundance Collab, which is a, um, an online um, education um, platform for writers that has a, that has a great community. So I would say use any of those and all of them and just start to be, you know, form your list. Um, if you did go to school, if you, you know, if you have been to film school, obviously your, your, your friends and your colleagues there, that's one of the really the best reasons to go to a program like that is to develop community. So do anything you can to develop community. And I would say, get your answers and your suggestions from people that are doing the same thing that you are, as opposed to friends and family. Thank you for that. Um, um, so, you know, you've partly answered the question that someone had here around, does it help for screenwriters to actually go to film school? And you've partially answered that, but I, I think because there are three questions similar to that, you know, does formal training matter? Does it have a positive effect on opportunities? Um, I think that What's interesting is that that's the answer to that question is changing pretty rapidly, in my opinion. I think that when I, you know, 25 years ago was in was in school, I went to NYU um, for acting and directing. I did not go to their film school. Um, at that time, I think that it was more important to go to film school because you didn't have access to equipment otherwise. To get the equipment to shoot your, your, your films and really to get the information that you needed, um, it was harder to get. You could get it, but it was harder to get without a formal program like that. But this yeah. is a different moment. I mean, we're different, living in a different time. There is so much available. There's so much available for free um, that I'm not convinced especially an expensive film program. I'm not convinced that that's worth it anymore. Um, the thing that is going to make the difference is not a connection you make in film school. It is the work that you create. You're going to create the work and it's the work that is going to, you know, create attention for you and, uh, and for what you're doing. I believe that right now with tools like, you know, smartphones, smartphone cameras, um, tools like, I mean, we have new AI tools coming out that are, that are astonishing, that are going to like, uh, if, if people here have not tried tools like ChatGPT or um, MidJourney, um, I would really start playing with them. They're free and they're artificial intelligence based tools where you can write in, I'd like to write a story about da, 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 da. And it will, it's like having a writing partner. It will talk back to you and it will give you, I've used it. And I, I actually think that those tools are pretty incredible. So between what you can find on YouTube, 
um, paying, you know, if you want to find courses to pay for online. If I were starting out today, I'm not convinced I would I would go to film school. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, and with the exception of you got to have community. Yeah. And so if film school is something that you can afford and that you um, that you really, really want to do, then I would say go for it. And, and that's great. I'm not saying it's not necessarily worth it. I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't back up the Brinks truck and spend your whole life savings on it. It's not, it, it's spend it on making a movie, make, make, make a movie. I like that. Um, I'm, I'm going to take two final questions. One from Afung Febe, Fege Evita. At what point do you say, and she was very passionate, you could see the capital letters. At, okay. at what point do you say no to the influence of the director, producer studios, funders in influencing the narrative of your story and script, considering they're funding it? How can I not lose my voice in writing? And how can I balance making money? Um, you know, what's a compromise? I, I love this question, uh, Evita. Um. If you know, will you tell me? Can you write it down and send me, <laughs> send me an email? Um, it's it's very challenging, and it doesn't. There's no clear. There's no clear answer. There there these kinds of um, challenges in collaboration come up constantly um, in in my life and my work as a writer, and I'm having to make these kinds of decisions and weigh these things every day and so what I would say is try to be open sometimes um often I'd say actually you can know like oh this person is not you know it's not the greatest at you know coming up with ideas to fix my story but if there's something that they're complaining about that might be a problem in the script. Mm. So I would always acknowledge the possibility that there's a problem and say to them, you might be right. Like maybe it is a little too long here. Let me think about that. Like I'm, I, that's my, that's my, that's my key. That's my go-to. Let me think about that mm. because I don't want to agree to do something in this moment now and then disappoint you later. I was like, let me think about that. That's interesting. Let me think about that. And then I'll write you an email later saying, yeah, I thought about it. I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, because in a certain way, you have to trust your collaborators. Mm. And in another way, especially if you're, if, 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 because this comes from different places. Sometimes it will come from, if you're a screenwriter, the director you're working with. I would have disagreements with Mira about the script and we would squabble over things. And I'm like, oh, I don't think that's the right way to do that. She's like, no, that's definitely the way we have to do it. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of collaborative debates that you want to really engage in as long as you are not going into a personal place where you're feeling you know, attacked. And I, I, I never think it's a good idea to take um, uh, certain kinds of suggestions about a, a, a script personally. People have their own ideas about things it's okay I so many times will find that the, my favorite thing I love the most will be the thing they'll say I didn't like that thing where you did da, 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 da. and I'll be like are you crazy that's the best thing in the whole so it's like I know I know that those moments happen I would say struggle to listen and then you be the one that comes up with the answer for how to fix it so you can say I thought about what you said about that area being too slow and mm -hmm. I think we should cut this part and this part. And if you provide an answer for to this person's problem, they won't shove their answer down your throat, which is what you're really trying to avoid. Mm. I like that. Um, um, the final question, and again, I tried to get, uh, you know, as much, I worked on diversity, Forgive me if your question wasn't answered. Um, we did the best that we could. From Rodney Nayo, um, he's a huge fan of your work. You know, I read that one of the best ways to learn how to write a script is to read the scripts from already made films and see how it's done. Um, but I don't have access. Do you have any recommendations on how one can get access to these scripts? 
um, or what to do if you can't get access to them? That's interesting. Um, yeah, I think that there are, there's, I mean, I would just say just like go rummaging in the internet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are, there's multiple good sites for screenwriters that many of which have libraries of PDFs of, of, of scripts. And so I would go to, you know, if there are places online that you like to go to for education or, you know, um, uh, John August has a really good site. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones that that might have PDF. I'll, I'll, I'll let me think about it. Maybe I can, yeah, give a follow up. But um, I agree that it's good to read screenplays. But what I would do is I would, if you can, get the draft, get the earlier draft. Mm, get the earlier draft. Okay. Because a lot of times, what happens is when you get a PDF online, you get the PDF of the movie itself and like a transcription of exactly the words and stuff that happens in the movie. Mm. That is always different than the screenplay that they started shooting with. Okay. Tons of things change in directing and editing and actors make things up on the set, which can be great. But if you want to really see what the screenwriter was doing, I would get the draft before the movie. They call it the shooting script. See if you can find the shooting script for the film. I think that you'd find that really fun to compare it against the movie because it's different, different than the movie. Get the shooting script. William, before we wrap up, um, I would request if you are open to sharing your socials so we Absolutely. could follow you um, and get feedback, you know, not stalk you, but just perhaps learn a bit more about your work and, and what you're doing and look forward to the book. I know our audience would really love your socials, if, if that's possible. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I'm at, um, at Bill, B-I-L-L -L underscore E underscore Wheeler. Um, if you find me on Twitter and you were at this workshop, just DM, follow me and DM me and I'll make sure that I've got your email and I will, and I will absolutely send you a copy of the book when I'm finished. I love it. So Bill underscore E underscore Wheeler on Twitter, please reach yeah. out DM and you will get the book. William, it's been my absolute pleasure. I feel like I'm ready to write a script of my own, to be honest. Go, do it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love your work. We all do. And we've learned so much. Thank you for your time. Any final words that you may have for us? I would just say that um, it's been a pleasure talking with you, that um, writing cross-cultural stories has been a great joy of my life. And what I'll leave you with is in terms of African stories, go look and see what's in the top 10 right now, globally on Netflix. Mm. There's a movie called Black Book. Yes. And it is made by a Nigerian director and it is a completely African story and it is beating everybody on Netflix right now. So there is a market for African stories. There is a market for, for um, the things that are coming out of this extraordinary part of the world that we don't that, that is not globally represented richly enough and so you guys are the filmmakers that I hope will do it and I look forward to, to your stories what a beautiful way to end thank you so much for giving us your time your knowledge and insights and thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in asking questions and sharing contact with each other um yes once again his his twitter is bill underscore e underscore wheeler um on twitter please reach out and inbox from us at africa no filter thank you so much thank you william have a lovely evening or morning depending on where you are in the world <laughs>